One of the most prolific types of creature in D&D is the monstrosity. Whenever any new monster manual comes out, there are two creature types that you can expect to see a lot of, humanoids and monstrosities. And we shouldn't be surprised, as these are timeless themes. Man and nature. These go back to the earliest of beginnings. And that's essentially how we can think of monstrosities. Nature run amok. It's already threatening enough to have carnivorous lions and venomous snakes, but merge them together into a single creature now. That is truly a monster. These stories go beyond merely hunting familiar animals. They deal with venturing into realms of the unknown, where heroes face mythical beasts beyond everyday wolves and wildcats. They're flesh-eating hybrids that stalk twisting labyrinths, and titanic behemoths that awaken from beneath the earth. Many of the D&D monstrosities are drawn from mythology, from Minotaur and Medusa, to Harpy and Chimera, to Basilisk and Hydra. These are tales that have been told and retold since ancient times, and they have evolved along with human civilization. They have endured across millennia of development. The monstrosities roar from the dark and primeval corners of our subconscious, and we ignore them at our own peril. Alongside many creatures of myth are those original specimens exclusive to D&D. The Grick, the Drider, Rust Monster, Astral Dreadnought. Yet, in many cases, they do have some similarity to pre-existing creatures from real-world history. In the end, most all creative endeavors are a sort of a remix, a stew of various influences, given a bit of a stir and only sprinkled with a touch of something truly original. That is what binds us all together in this. So join me once again, my brave companions, as we journey beyond the safe confines of our homely abodes, into the wilderness, into the ruins of old, into the mystifying mazes, where we shall confront a horde of ferocious and outstanding creatures, the monstrosities of Dungeons and Dragons. As always, I'm going to peer deeply into this group of monsters. Using a critical eye, I rate the monsters in five main attributes. Mechanics, which looks for interesting, fun, and unique abilities. Style, which is a combination of appearance and attitude. Role-playing, which values social interaction beyond simply raw role for initiative. Lore, which gives us stories, details, depth, and adventure leads and versatility, which looks at the amount of variety in the roles and objectives. A monster that receives a low rating and ends up in F tier or D tier is not worthless. It simply has big limitations, and this can even be good sometimes. For example, when a DM needs a group of simpler monsters to fill out an encounter. Furthermore, you yourself can always add additional things to a monster to make it more interesting in some way. But I'm not here to rate your skills, I'm just looking at what is actually presented in the books. I'm going to be referencing mainly 5th edition in this video, though I do try to keep in mind prior editions and the legacy that a monster might have in the game. I should also say that due to the sheer volume of monstrosities in the game, it's not possible for me to include them all here. If you would like to see more monstrosities rankings in the future, Leave me a comment and like this video, so I can know that there is a demand for this creature type. Now, raise your blazing torches, cast your light cantrips, we delve into a mega dungeon where lurk all manner of monsters. Oh, F-tier, the simpletons, the misfits, the half-baked. While I don't envy them, they do fill their own important place in the grand scheme of the D&D world. One day, long ago, when I was but a young and hopeful bardling, I was strolling through the woods, taking in the beauty of nature. A savage beast came bounding through the forest and attacked me. It had the body of a bear and the head of... an owl. Its claws mauled me, its beak pecked me, it hooted with great savagery. I noticed a gnome nearby and I called for help. The little man only laughed at my misfortune and slunk away into the safety of his wee tunnel. The situation was dire. My life flashed before my eyes. 
I had to fight. I shouted at the owlbear, one of the few simple cantrips my young bardic self knew. Vicious mockery. You call that pathetic hoot a battle cry? Your bunghole must be jealous of the amount of shit that comes out of your mouth. The owlbear flinched, viciously mocked and brutally ridiculed. I seized the opportunity and dashed away to a tree. I climbed up as quickly as I could. The brute pursued me. It climbed as well. I went out onto a limb of no great thickness. As the owlbear came out onto the tree limb, I leapt and grabbed onto another. Strained under the immense weight of the beast, the limb broke, sending the owlbear plunging down onto the hard ground below. It roared in pain, hopefully breaking a rib or two, and proceeded to give up its attempt to prey upon me. While it tramped away through the underbrush, I hurled one last magically infused jab. My wounds are going to heal, but there is no cure for your stupidity! And from that day forward, I have always disliked owlbears and gnomes. Just look at this ridiculous thing. Some animal parts do mix well. Eagle and lion. Dragon and scorpion. Ram and bat. But others do not mix so well. We can't just put a cat head on a crocodile body and expect it to go over well. Even one of its abilities makes no sense. Keen smell? Keen sight, yes, absolutely, that would make sense. But owls have terrible senses of smell. They even eat skunks. What it should have is keen sight and hearing. The owlbear also suffers from the big dumb brute complex, just like slews of other monsters from ogres, hill giants, hezraus, goristros, many others. The brute does have an important function in the bigger picture, but the issue is that they're all just mechanically the same thing. It's a simple-minded mound of hit points that hits hard in melee brawls. Look at the brown bear and tell me what is the difference between brown bear and owl bear. The owl bear has slightly bigger numbers when it comes to its stats, like AC, hit points, and damage, and that's it. No hoot or screech ability, no strange aura or extraordinary ability or unique trait. It's a vanilla stat block of basic attacks with zero role-playing interaction, paltry lore, no place in the world except an animalistic predator, maybe a trained guard beast, and to top it off, a wacky appearance. The owlbear is the lowest rated monster I have come across yet in all of my rankings. I bite my thumb at it. Continuing on to the next basic predator monster is the Grick. The good news is that it does have a pretty cool style. The bad news is, well, that's about all it has. What you see here is what you get. It's a big worm that crawls around trying to eat stuff. Its lore gives us almost nothing to work with. Listen to this from the Grick's description. Spoils of slaughter. Over time, Grick layers accumulate the cast-off possessions of intelligent prey. Oh yeah? A monster that has treasure in its lair? Wow! What a concept! This paragraph goes on to talk about Underdark explorers finding clever ways to plunder the booty from a Grick den. There are two problems here. One is that you could say the same thing about any monster. And two, if you have a party that's capable of exploring the Underdark, you can probably handle fighting some CR2 Gricks, especially considering the fact that they have no ranged combat. The Grix's claim to fame is that it has an especially thick and rubbery hide that repels most weapons. In 5e terms, this means that it has resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. Ooh, that seems quite effective, you say. Low-level characters probably won't have magical weapons. But allow me to draw your attention to the monster's hit points. 27. The Dungeon Master's Guide states that a typical CR2 monster will have 86 to 100 hit points. 27 is the hit point total of a CR 1 8th monster. Even if we use the table, effective hit points based on resistances and immunities, the Grix's effective hit points are then 54, which is rated for a CR 1 half monster. Okay, well, perhaps the Grix makes up for the low hit points with a high AC. No. Its AC is 14. 
Okay, it makes up for the overall low defense by having a high offense. Well, no. If the Grick hits with both its tentacles and its beak attacks, it does an average of 14 damage, which is on the lower end of what's expected for a CR2. And besides that, the Grick isn't supposed to be a low defense monster. It is specifically described as having thick hide that is tough to get through, and that is how it played out in 4th edition and 3rd edition. Two of my biggest criticisms about 5th edition are the monster design and the encounter building. For whatever reason, they ended up confusing and flawed. Beh. So, sadly, the Grick is one of those monsters that actually got worse in 5th edition. Sorry, buddy. Another monster that I didn't expect would end up in F tier is the Onkeg, as I do think it's fairly cool. They are giant burrowing insect things that have tunneling forelimbs, clamping mandibles, and acid sprays. They live in underground burrows, though sometimes they come up to prey upon fresh meat. The great thing about the Onkeg is that it's the kind of monster that creates dungeons. In this case, it's due to their tunnel building. I love the idea of an adventuring party exploring a typical underground ruin and coming across a section where Onkegs have tunneled into the dungeon, and the characters can then choose to explore the tunnels. Will it lead to a different part of the dungeon? To a separate cave? To a confusing network of passages that will boggle the adventurers and leave them hopelessly lost, only to then be ambushed by terrible crawling bug monsters in the dark? Another nice detail about the Onkeg is its tremor sensibility, which can quickly thwart characters who rely on stealth or invisibility. There's something very satisfying about a rhino-sized insect crunching down on a character who was traipsing around smug with his invisibility. But that's all the Onkeg has. It's a bug. Don't expect much from it. In a way, F-Tier sets the tone for many of the monstrosities to come. They have some interesting themes, some compelling elements, but also some real limitations, especially for all those that have this simple, animalistic behavior. Bravely onward we press through crumbling halls where kings once held great gatherings, now the domains of hungering monsters that are only known through legends. Like the Onkeg, the Bullet is a burrowing monster who can add some interesting tunnel formations to a dungeon. However, this monster is far more predatory and ferocious, so it is most known for hunting attacks. There is a reason some people refer to this creature as the Land Shark. Interestingly, not only does it burrow, but it is also a very powerful jumper. It even has a jump attack that knocks its enemies prone while simultaneously crushing and clawing them. This is another simple-minded brute-type monster, when the bullet attacks, it shows little aptitude for strategy, doesn't even seem to grasp the concept of being outmatched or outnumbered. Why is it so aggressive? So wild and bloodthirsty? Well, a leading theory is that the bullet was originally created by a mad wizard who combined a snapping turtle with an armadillo, then infused the creature with demon blood. Luckily, this doesn't come off quite as silly as the owlbear, though it does leave the bullet on the simple side of the game. As I mentioned previously, this is not necessarily a bad thing. Oftentimes, a DM really does need a more straightforward and easy monster to run. So, in that way, the bullet is fairly successful. You won't see a campaign that features bullets as central antagonists any more than you would with crocodiles or black puddings, but that's okay. Not every meal needs to be fine dining. Continuing with the animal theme, we have the Displacer Beast. It is a large-sized black panther with six legs and a pair of barbed tentacles growing from its shoulders. Most notably, the creature projects a mirage-like displacement that makes it appear to be a few feet away from its actual location. In game terms, anyone targeting the Displacer Beast with an attack has disadvantage, though if hit, the creature loses its displacement ability until the end of its next turn. The problem I have with this is that the creature's AC is already low at 13, so this ability comes off underwhelming. 
I would think that the displacement would impose a 50% mischance or something of the sort because it's independent of how accurate an attacker is. In other words, it shouldn't matter if my attack was plus 3 to hit or plus 10 to hit. I'm still just as likely to attack into the wrong place due to not seeing the true position of this octopus cat. Also odd about this creature is that it has no bite or claw attacks. Why? Purely for balance purposes? To force this creature into CR3? It has six sets of panther claws and a mouthful of fangs. We're supposed to believe that it only attacks with those tentacles? Meh. As well, it has no proficiency with any skill. Not stealth, not perception like a feline predator would have. It has no climbing ability either. It does have avoidance, which is like the rogue's evasion, but it applies to all saving throws. But the monster is proficient with no saving throws. The 5th edition version of this monster frustrates me in much the same way that the Grick does. The game designers kept up the same concept, but when it came time to creating the mechanics that express the concept, they dropped the ball. It seems they favored simple and easy over slightly complex and more challenging. Lore-wise, the Displacer Beast originates in the Feywild, the realm of dream-touched landscapes and fairy courts. The cruel fey of the Unseedly Court captured the Displacer Beasts and trained them to hunt down unicorns, pegasi, and other noble creatures. According to the Monster Manual, it didn't take the Displacer Beasts long to use their malevolent intelligence to escape their masters. Their intelligence of six, and no language nor opposable thumbs. Okay. The newly escaped Displacer Beasts caught the attention of the good-hearted Seelie Court who, along with their trained blink dogs, hunted down the displacer beasts, yet also inadvertently drove them into the material plane. Why didn't they just follow them and finish the job? Who knows? Moving on to mid-D tier, we come across our first specimen derived from mythology, the cockatrice. It received some fantastic artwork in the 5e monster manual, which looks to be from Sam Wood, one of the lead artists who defined 3rd edition style. Though, I'm not entirely sure, as the 5th edition books don't directly credit the artist right on the page. <clears throat> this monster only gets a single paragraph of lore, and it is yet another simplistic, animalistic kind of monster. The cockatrice features throughout history, most easily recognized through British heraldry, where it is something like a small wyvern with a rooster's head. From there, we can trace it back to antiquity in ancient Rome, Greece, and Egypt. Some say the cockatrice and the basilisk both evolved from the same mythological concept, and they might have been originally inspired by the cobra or the crocodile. Mythologically, a cockatrice originates when a rooster, aka cock, lays an egg, and said egg is then sat by a toad or a snake. The cockatrice comes forth a vile hybrid creature with deadly powers. Some say its gaze petrifies victims. Others say its gaze shoots out deadly poison. Others claim its touch or bite causes death. Others still say the creature's breath is deadly. There are purported methods of dispatching of a cockatrice, such as tricking it into gazing upon its own reflection or reflecting its poison spray or it hearing a rooster's call, or someone tossing another rooster's egg over his family's house without touching the roof or walls. Another legend claims that weasels are immune to the cockatrice's powers and prey upon the little monsters. Unfortunately, the Monster Manual gives us no such mythological information and very scarce lore at that. This makes my inquisitive mind wonder, what does the cockatrice represent? One thing that's for sure is that the cockatrice is related to serpents. You could also say it's related to dragons, but then again, the dragon itself is related to serpents. The serpent represents renewed life or everlasting life as it regularly sheds its skin and becomes young again. It's also associated with immortality or infinity because of its ability to coil into a circle, a shape without beginning or end. They are fearsome predatory creatures who swallow their prey whole, and certain varieties are venomous. They also represent the unknown, 
the cold reptilian things, more ancient than us, who dwell out in the uncharted wilderness and in deep, dark places. Never has there been a more powerful mythological creature than the serpent and all of its associated forms. And ultimately, as we see in mythology, and in literature, in movies, and particularly in D&D, the worm dragon is also the guardian that holds what we seek. The treasure, the gold, the beautiful maiden, the magical elixir, the secret knowledge that will bring us to a greater state. Here now we see the cockatrice, who holds the tremendous mythical power of the serpent, and it is combined with a rooster, a familiar, domesticated animal of our own homes and farms. This is our own little snake monster, our rural wyvern, our domestic dragon. It shares in the heritage of the everlasting serpent, its power can be both boon and poison, and it can terrorize the invaders who must meet the gaze of our household wormling. Because of this, it garners our affection and shows up in our heraldry and family crests. The cockatrice's connections run deep, my friends, but I must state the truth that D&D has given us a cheap and simplified version of this monster. I love Dungeons & Dragons, and 5th edition is a wonderful game, but time and time again I find myself unsatisfied with its reduced Greatest Hits album style. Cockatrice, while you cannot clear D tier as you are presented in the Monster Manual, this bard gives you a nod of respect and a wink for knowing who you truly are. Continuing with awe-inspiring mythological beasts, we encounter the griffin, which has the body of a lion and the head, wings, and forelegs of an eagle. A giant eagle at that, for this aerial predator is so large that its favored prey animal is the horse. It swoops down from an area atop a cliff or other high place and tears into its target with beak and talons. And just as an eagle, the griffin has exceptionally keen sight, which it uses to hunt from its lofty vantage point. Another way in which one might encounter a griffin is as a trained mount. It is no simple feat to raise, feed, and train one, but for an expert trainer of exotic beasts, a griffin develops into a wonderful mount. It's fiercer and tougher than a horse, it's capable of high-speed flight, and it's tremendously loyal and protective of its master. The master, by the way, would be wise to equip the griffin with some barding, as its AC of 12 is quite low. As with the cockatrice, the griffin gets an incredibly limited amount of lore in the monster manual. Giving it a rating of 2 is as generous as I can possibly be. In the real world, the griffin was a prominent mythological beast from the Near East that reaches back into the mists of the BC era. It eventually made its way both east through Asia and west into Greece and then into Europe. They are typically seen as majestic and powerful guardians, protecting tombs and vaults, or even palaces and royal places. The eagle and the lion are both noble animals, after all. The griffin continued to thrive throughout the Middle Ages in both heraldry and Christian culture. The creature was associated with protection, loyalty, and nobility, as well as medicine. Four different parts of its body could cure various ailments, such as its feathers curing blindness, which relates back to its association with superior vision. Once more, I must give tribute and honor to this fantastic creature, and I extend my regrets that the Monster Manual did not do you more justice in terms of lore. The griffin shall remain forever a revered monster in our hearts and minds. Now we come to a monster that I have long had mixed feelings about. It's metal-plated, but not a construct. It's a living creature. It's called... Gorgon, but it's not a Medusa, rather a bull. How could D&D get something so wrong? Everyone knows that a Gorgon is this, not this. Interestingly, this photo is one I took myself here in my hometown of Wichita, Kansas. It seems that we have a Gorgon bull in our own town history. Hmm. But where did this mix-up come from? Lo and behold, the History of Four-Footed Beasts by Edward Topsell, published in 1607. This work details a number of fantastical creatures, including the Libyan Beast, also known as the Gorgon. 
In addition, the book describes a half-woman, half-lion creature called the Lamia, which also is a derailing from the original Lamia of Greek mythology. And there is a monkey-like creature called the Sioux, which gives us D&D's Sioux monster. So even in D&D's very roots, we find the game designers doing some wacky things, which take hold and propagate. They are memes in the technical sense of the word. <sighs> Rest in peace, Gary Gygax. Instead of a petrifying gaze like Medusa, the Gorgon has a petrifying breath. It's also a big dumb brute monster that will charge and stomp you. Honestly, I would much rather prefer this monster have a different name and actually be a construct. They could be like the Colchis Bulls of Greek myth. And there could be variants including fire breathing and the petrifying gas, etc. All they would need is a more viable name such as Bronze Bull or Ferritar. And then Gorgon could be the snake-haired monster people that we all know. The Carrion Crawler is one of the best D-tier monsters ever. Sure, it's just a big bug, but look at the thing. No, no, not the 5th edition art. The real Carrion Crawler with the freaky eye stalks. This one just looks ferocious. Ferocious is less scary than weird. The first time I laid eyes upon the Carrion Crawler back in 3rd edition creeped me out. It gave me an unsettling feeling. Probably related to other creepy and odd moments from things I watched as a young child. With the Carrion Crawler, what you see is what you get. No pretentious abilities, no underutilized potential. It is a giant worm that crawls through dungeons and crypts eating carcasses. It has spider climb, keen smell, a bite, and tentacles that inflict a paralysis inducing poison. That is exactly the right mix for a CR2 monster. In 3rd edition, the crawler had 8 tentacle attacks, and the paralysis lasted for 2d4 rounds. In 5th edition, it has 1 tentacles attack, and the paralysis gives the victim the chance to overcome it at the end of each of his turns. And that, kids, is because 5th edition monsters are easy mode. Well, most of them. The next creature is another that I personally enjoy. The Dark Mantle is a sort of squid bat that has the appearance of a stalactite while it's motionless. They hunt dark places using their echolocation, typically in caves, and also in the Underdark and the Shadowfell. The preferred tactic of the Dark Mantle is to emanate an aura of pure black shadow, much like the Darkness spell, and then they descend from above and attach themselves onto the prey's head, thus blinding and suffocating the creature. The Dark Mantle is a small creature that's not physically tough, but if its prey has no means of counteracting the Darkness aura, it can pose a serious threat. Dark vision and natural light sources are not enough to penetrate this magical darkness, and it dispels light created by second level and lower spells, such as the Light Cantrip. To overcome this supernatural gloom, one needs stronger light magic or more advanced senses such as blind sight or devil sight. This is another simple and animal-like monstrosity, but it's a great entry in the low CR range. The Purple Worm, a devastating monstrosity that has long instilled dread in adventurers of the D&D world. This creature is so massive that it can swallow a horse whole, so immense that it can burrow through solid rock and still leave behind a 10 foot wide tunnel in its wake. So humongous that miniatures of it can really only show part of the creature as it's bursting up from the ground. The average size of an adult purple worm is 80 feet long, but older and rare specimens can be even bigger. As we've already seen a number of times in this ranking, the purple worm has next to nothing in terms of social interaction. Its intelligence is one, after all. It is a hungry, hungry predator who crawls through the earth seeking prey so voraciously that any Underdark community that intends to survive long term must put up magical wards that strengthen the cavern rock, lest a purple worm come burrowing through and devour everyone. Flesh is not the only thing purple worms eat. As they burrow, they continuously consume earth, stone, and whatever other matter composing the underground environment. Their great innards process these minerals, 
except for the harder ones like gemstones, which they then excrete out. Jeweled feces. Diamond poop. Not a bad thing for an adventurer to step in. Unless, of course, the purple worm is lurking nearby. Mechanics-wise, the purple worm has a lot of hit points, it's incredibly strong, and it has both a bite that can swallow the target and a sting that delivers one of the strongest poisons in the game. The only real issue here is that for several print runs of the monster manual, the purple worm's attack bonus was incorrect. It was missing the proficiency bonus. Thus, it showed plus 9 to hit instead of plus 14. That makes quite a difference. The creature also has blind sight and tremor sense, as one would expect. So while the purple worm has no personality or versatility, and it's really light on lore, it is still an iconic monster from the D&D world, and one that is sure to cause a reaction when it makes the scene. Mythologically, the basilisk shares a heritage with the cockatrice. Essentially everything we went over in the cockatrice entry also applies here, as the two are connected historically. Again, this includes a strange origin that involves two animals of different kinds, a death-dealing poison or gaze or breath, and an element of admiration or veneration within our culture. In Dungeons & Dragons, these two monsters are indeed quite similar. The cockatrice is small size, challenge rating one half, its petrification only lasts one day and is inflicted by way of its bite. The basilisk is medium size, challenge rating three, its petrification is permanent and inflicted by way of its gaze that any creature looking at the basilisk can suffer. Aesthetically and thematically, I consider the basilisk a great monster, a true classic really. It exists in upper D tier in this ranking and I would like to give it a higher position, but it has such huge limitations as presented in the monster manual. Specifically, non-existent social interaction, incredibly scarce lore, and very low versatility. Its existence is merely a bestial predator, and in rare cases a trained guard beast. This results in a monster that looks great when you see it in the book, and in your imagination it is inspiring, but in play it's fairly limited. There are a thousand grisly fates for those brave adventurers who explore the dungeons of the D&D world. Being lassoed by a giant spider crab, pulled up to its high ledge and eaten, is probably one of the more unique ways to die. The cave fissure is one of the most creepy and interesting underdark monstrosities that I can think of. In some ways, it reminds me of the xenomorphs from the Alien movie series, not only in appearance, but also how it creates a role reversal. In this case, people become the unsuspecting fish that get caught, when usually we're the ones that are accustomed to being the fishers. I will admit that I think this monster was mechanically mishandled in Volo's Guide to Monsters, unfortunately. For starters, it should be large size. That would make it easier for it to reel in prey the likes of elves, dwarves, humans, orcs, etc. The biggest issue, though, is with its filament. It has both a filament trait and a filament action, but neither of them specify anything about the creature actually making an attack roll to snare its prey. Does it just automatically hit? The designers made sure to detail so much about the filament, except how it actually works. The roper was designed much better in this aspect, in my opinion. I also think the monster needs a little bit more hit points and damage output. Otherwise, it's just reeling in prey that's going to end up killing it. If you think about it, CR3 is pretty low for a solo hunter in the Underdark, which is one of the most dangerous and brutal environments in the game. Luckily, the cave fisher has a couple interesting details that add to its ecology. One is that not only is it an edible crustacean-like food source, but its filament is a natural resource for underground races. And its blood is a type of liquor used as an ingredient in certain underdark brews, or even drunk straight by those of a more daring persuasion. Another noteworthy point is that cave fishers are naturally afraid of fire, and their blood is flammable in fact. Some underground races collect and hatch cave fisher eggs, raising the young to be guard beasts, and employing fire as an effective means of exerting control through the rearing and training process. At the very top of D tier is the Chimera, a veritable mascot of the monstrosity creature type. 
With this creature, we see once again the amazing staying power of mythology. The chimera traces back far into the mists of the ancient world. Ancient Greeks defined it as the composite of lion, goat, and snake, which also breathe fire. But further back into Mesopotamia and the very earliest civilizations known, we find chimera-like or manticore-like winged lions. Many theories exist as to what the chimera represents symbolically. The dragon or the snake, volcano or thunderstorm, the great fertile mother or the dark side of the feminine, even the hero's quest itself or the facing of the great evil one. I find this abundance of ideas really quite fitting as this is a creature of many parts and many different aspects all put together. It's bewildering, it's confusing, it's terrifying. It is a monstrosity of chaos and savagery. In the D&D world, according to 5th edition lore, the first chimeras were created by none other than the demon lord Demogorgon himself. Upon being summoned into the world by mortals, he regarded the mundane animals he found there as weak and simple. He set about fusing together an amalgam of different creatures, thus forming the multi-headed horror we see here, and infusing it with the grim cruelty and fearsome destructiveness of demon kind. In the case of the Chimera, the creature combines the worst traits of its constituent parts. The dragon's lust for raiding and greedily accumulating a treasure hoard. The lion's nature to hunt and dominate a territory. The goat's stubbornness and appetite to eat everything. Additionally, the Chimera has its hated rivals in the form of other fantastic beasts such as griffins, manticores, wyverns, and dragons. Chimera are known to torment and torture their prey, exhibiting a fiendish type of cruelty. Though, like with dragons, it is possible to garner favor with the Chimera by offering it gifts, flattery, possibly sacrifices depending upon how gray-hearted you are. A well-fed and well-bribed Chimera can potentially be a powerful ally, though a villainous one. Combat-wise, a Chimera has melee attacks in the form of bites and horns and claws, as well as a fire breath that functions much like a dragon's, though unfortunately it only has a short range of a 15-foot cone. I would probably bump that up to a 30-foot cone personally, which still would make it fairly close range. It can fly quickly, though its land speed is only 30, the same as a regular person. Again, I think that's odd. I'd probably increase that a bit due to its lion body, lions being one of the fastest land animals after all. And to top it off, the Chimera has expertise in perception, lending well to its apex hunter status. Its challenge rating is 6, so it's on par with monsters such as Cyclops, Medusa, Wyvern, and Young White Dragon. Is that a bit too low? Maybe. But that's why the gods made Dungeon Masters, my friends. I can't wait to brew up an advanced Chimera to give some adventurers a stronger challenge along with a greater sense of accomplishment in having faced this, the king of the low-tier monstrosities. D-tier had a lot of entries in it, and honestly, I could have kept going with creatures such as the Death Dog, Hippogriff, Winter Wolf, and Fae Spider. But there is such a large amount of monstrosities in the bestiaries of D&D that it would be better if we just press on. In fact, C-tier is going to give us a ton more to look at, so I'll save them for the next video. If you love monsters as much as I do, and you want to see some unique, original creatures, check out my Patreon page. Every month I select two of my Lorekeeper patrons to submit monster concepts, which I then develop into original 5th edition monsters, complete with stat block, custom art, and lore. I also make big black and white dungeon maps that you can print or you can use online. I appreciate all of your support and I hope that my content continues to enhance your own encounters and campaigns. This is Esper. I'll see you all again soon in Monstrosities Part 2. And as always, may your adventures be many.